Okay, let's get started. Okay, so today we will discuss your first hack, um, buffer overflow. Today we will only talk about very simple buffer overflow. Then later it get, it gets um, more difficult, more complicated, complicated scenarios. Uh, so buffer overflow is a classic software security uh, problem, uh, especially stack-based buffer overflow is also called sequential buffer overflow. Um, we will say later that because you override things sequentially. So in sequential buffer overflow, the attacker tries to overflow data on the stack in a sequential manner. Uh, we will spend several weeks on this topic because this is the first hack. So there are a lot of things uh, you need to catch up with. And uh, after talking about buffer overflow, then we will move faster on other topics. They are more advanced. So I will first give you an extremely brief uh, history of uh, buffer overflow. Then we will say uh, what information a safe program needs to run. We will go through uh, several examples uh, of uh, overflowing uh, local variables and also return addresses. Um, so the examples here are carefully designed, so they are unlikely to appear in real world code. Uh, next week we will take a look at something. Not, 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 not next class we will take a look at something more uh, realistic. Um, okay, so the object tips of uh, buffer overflow starting this, including understanding how stack works in Linux. Well, most of the stack works the same way. Uh, also, uh, you will be able to identify a buffer overflow in a program and also learn how to exploit those buffer overflow uh, vulnerabilities. A little bit uh, history of uh, buffer overflow. Uh, Stack-based buffer overflow is a type of vulnerability discovered back in the 80s. Uh, it was just impossible to tell who was the first person discovered that. Um, but this vulnerability played an important role in the first finally convictions in the US under the 1986 Computer Fraud and uh, Abuse Act. So there was a student in Cornell University. Uh, I believe he was uh, an undergraduate student at that time. So right now he's a professor at uh, MIT, uh, very famous for his work in theoretical computing uh, system, uh, also system computing. So uh, his name was, uh, is uh, Robert Morris. Uh, he wrote the infamous Morris, Morris Worm uh, back in 1988. Um, and the Worm attacks other computers in the internet using uh, buffer overflow vulnerabilities uh, as one of its attack vectors. And the Morris Worm uh, was the first computer was considered the first computer virus or computer worm uh, received uh, significant uh, media attention. So before Robert uh, Morris uh, becomes this world famous computer scientist, become a professor at MIT, uh, he was uh, also, he, right now he's an ATM fellow. Uh, also he's very successful in startups. Uh, he was, uh, before all that, uh, he was actually convicted for this uh, incident. Uh, however, buffer overflow back then was still like uh, dark magic, uh, mainly because uh, not many people know how to do that. Uh, there were no uh, well-written documents explaining how it works. Uh, until 1996, uh, a very well-written article titled Smash the Stack for fun and profit was uh, published online in on this online hacking magazine called uh, 
uh, track, and this magazine still exists. Uh, we still accept some interesting hacking articles. So many people learned for the first time how buffer overflow uh, works and how to exploit them from this article. So this is considered a classic. So you need to read this as part of the homework. Uh, the author of this article was under a pseudonym called the uh, Alpha One. Um, so if you just Google online this name, you will you will be able to find out who this guy really is. So um, even though this buffer overflow type of vulnerability has been discovered for almost uh, thirty years, uh, as you can see in this screen, uh, I took from Nitric website on um, Common Weekly's enumeration. Uh, buffer overflow is still ranked uh, very high here. It's still ranked number one. This is a number one vulnerability in uh, progress. Uh, actually, we will discuss many other vulnerabilities in this table. For example, here, number seven, uh, use after free. We will talk about this one in heap exploitation at the end of the semester. Also, uh, integer overflow. Um, we will talk this one a little bit. Uh, you can see there are other vulnerabilities. Some of them are web-based, for example, cross-site request forgery. Uh, that, that will be discussing for web security class, not this class. Okay, that's the, all the history of buffer overflow you need to know. Uh, now we can dive into hacking. For any C program, uh, it needs the following information at runtime. Um, first of all, there is code. If there is no code, nothing to run. There are parameters for a function. There is a return value. In C function, technically, there is only one return value. If you want to return more things, you have to pass a pointer into the function and use uh, the address to give you the return value. There are local variables, global variables, and also some temporary variables. Uh, there is a return address when you're calling to a function, when that function uh, finishes, it, it has to go to another place to continue execution of the program. And that place is called the return address. And to maintain those information, we also have something called um, a function string. And every function, depending on how you implement this, uh, in general, every function has a function frame. And there is a function frame pointer. And there are uh, many function frames. So there are previous functions uh, frame pointers as well. So um, when you program in C, you don't really care about uh, how those things are really mapped uh, into machine code or mapped into uh, memory, because uh, that's the compiler developer's job to do that. Um, so if you are a compiler developer, uh, one of the questions you need to decide is, where do you store all those information, right? Uh, of course, on different uh, hardware platforms, you can make uh, different choices, but uh, uh, for uh, most architectures we are using now, uh, we, uh, those different information, they store at the same uh, place across different uh, architectures. Uh, so let's start with something simple, the global and the local variables. Uh, you know the difference between global variables and local variables as a state developer. Uh, local variables are those declared in a function or in a function block. So only code in that function or block can access that local variable. Uh, outside the function, uh, the local variable doesn't exist, other functions uh, we're be not able to uh, access those local variables. Uh, global variables are defined outside any function. So they hold their values throughout the lifetime of the program, and they can be accessed inside any function defined for the program. Um, you can also give parameters or arguments uh, to functions. Those parameters are kind of like local variables. You can access them in the function, uh, but outside of that function, uh, you cannot access it. 
Um, so this is basically a view from a developer's perspective. Uh, in this class, we need to look a little bit lower at the developer, say developer layer. Uh, we need to look at the machine level to say how this is actually implemented um, in compilers. So I give you a very simple C program here. Um, obviously, we can compile this into an L file, which we discussed uh, um, Monday. So as you can see, this program, we have uh, two functions, two global variables. There is a main function. There is a func function. The main function takes two arguments, the func function takes what? Uh, there are two global variables. One is called uh, g um, underscore i, and uh, that one is initialized as a string. The second one is just a pointer, it's not initialized. There are many local variables. For example, the main function has uh, l underscore i. The func function also has uh, l underscore i, but they are different, okay? Even though they have the same name, they do not conflict with each other because they are in different, defined in different functions. So this program is very simple. This program only print out the address of those variables. There is a local variable, variable initialized to zero, another one um, not initialized. So we first, in main function, we print out the global variable, g underscore use address, then we print out um, our g underscore i, then g underscore u. Then we print out the local variable uh, li, l use address. Then we just call the function func. Then in function func, um, there is this argument, also two local variables. We're going to print out the two local variables address and also print out the address of the parent parameter here, okay? That's it. We're going to print out seven things uh, in this program. So uh, let's take a look um, if we which one is this global variable 32 bit. Okay, let's go with this one. So we just run this program. When we run this program, you can see uh, everything's address. You can see the global variables address. This is a 32 bit version. The global variable is at somewhere like 5663 something. Another one is 5663 something. Okay. So they start with 56. Uh, those local variables. This start as some address like ff, okay? So remember the memory map I showed you this Monday at a very high address, that is where the stack is. So all those local variables are actually in the stack, including that argument p. That one is also in the stack. If you try the 64-bit uh, version, let's do the 64-bit version. 64-bit version. You get almost the same result. So the global variables is like at the middle of the address space. The uh, local variables or at a much higher address, but this is not the top. Well, this is actually the top, the 64 bit, because the 64 bit system we are using right now is not using the full 64 bit. That's why uh, the very top is not really FF. So you can see, but from here you can see even the parameter, the P is also on the stack, okay? So um, in summary, 
uh, where do we store things? We store code in the dot txt section, which you already tried uh, in your homework. We store parameters on the stack. We can also store parameters in registers, actually. I will show you some examples later. Um, the return value in the architecture we are using always stored in the register uh, EAX or if the 64 bit, the RAX. Then global variables, they are in the BSF section for uninitialized global variables or dot .ana section for uh, initialized and readable writable global variables. Uh, local variables, they are on stack or if you have enough registers, sometimes they could be placed on registers as well. Uh, temporal variables are kind of like local variables, the same thing. Uh, most importantly for this class is the return address is also placed on stack. Uh, this is determined by the Intel architecture, which we'll say later in several instructions, you can say the return address is placed on stack. And that is why there is a buffer overflow because return address technically is a control flow information. It's controlled data. It's not, um, it's not uh, other type of data. So we are mixing control information with data together. And when you override some data, you can also override the control information. That is the root cause of the problem buffer overflow we have here. We also store the previous functions um, string pointer on the stack as well. Uh, you will see that later. So as you can see, a lot of data such as uh, no -go variables, uh, parameters are stored on the stack. And the stack is essentially a scratch memory for each function. Stack is used in um, all the popular platforms we are familiar with. Uh, MIPS, um, x86 or 64. Um, also in most platforms, the stack goes from high addresses to low addresses. Um, so when we say the top of the stack, it is actually the lower address um, because the stack goes down. So when I say top of the stack, it's a lower address. When I say bottom of the stack, it's a, a higher address. The two basic operations for stack, uh, as, learn, as you learn from your data structure class, uh, are just a push and a pop. The push operation will put an item on the stack, so the stack uh, goes down. Uh, the pop operation will pop the top item on the stack out. Uh, there is no operation to remove any arbitrary item uh, out of the stack. If you want to remove any arbitrary item, you use a list, right? Or something like that. Um, to implement a stack, uh, we need some kind of a pointer or index or uh, indicator to tell us where the bottom and the top of the stack is. Um, x86, the architecture we are using, uh, we the register ESP holds the address of the top of the stack. ESP always points to the top of the stack. Uh, we also have uh, uh, EBP here uh, to hold the, usually hold the bottom of the function or functions stack. Uh, we will talk about that later. Uh, let's say we have, I have an example here. We have a push EAX or push RAX. Obviously, EAX is four bytes, RAX is uh, eight bytes. So when we run this instruction, uh, the stack pointer, the ESP or e RBP, uh, this is a typo here, actually, it should be uh, RSP, uh, where a decrement four bytes or eight bytes, then store the value of EAX. Uh, to the location where the stack pointer points to. So if there is a instruction pop EAX, so in this instruction, you do not say in the syntax, you mentioning uh, ESP, it doesn't, but it is implied here. It will read data 
from where ESP points to, put that data into EAX. Even though from the syntax here, you do not say ESP. After that, it will uh, increment the value of ESP. Uh, there are obviously more instructions that uh, affect the stack, not only push and pop. There are a call instruction, return instruction, uh, which are super important for our class, will also influence the stack. Also, there is enter leave, I briefly mentioned the uh, last class. Okay, uh, next we will take an even closer look at those instructions. Uh, the first instruction is uh, push, uh, like I said. Uh, when I, whenever I draw a stack, I draw, whenever I draw a memory, I draw the high address at the top, low address at the bottom. So you can see here, um, we assume ESP, the stack pointer register, points to some value X. Uh, in the memory. Then we execute the instruction push EAX. What happens is the ESP will first get decremented. So ESP will point to something at a lower address, in this case four bytes, because we're only pushing four bytes. Then move that EAX value into that new uh, memory address ESP points to. Okay. This I hope everyone understand this. Any questions? Good, okay. So pop is the reverse operation of push. So what, So let's assume ESP still points to this value X. Now we execute pop EAX. Two things will happen. The first is that value X goes to EAX. The second thing is ESP, uh, the value will increment, so it will point to the value one. However, at this memory location, this X doesn't change, okay? So technically at this memory location, the value here is still X, okay? So that is the uh, pop instruction. Uh, then we have the very important core instruction. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by that? So the next instruction we're looking at is the call instruction, which is used to make procedure calls. So you say when you have a function, you make a call to that function, that is usually implemented in this call instruction in uh, the Intel architecture. So the core instruction is obviously a little bit more complicated than the push instruction uh, at the bottom. I feel this is um, uh, the instructions, the code. Um, um, this one I call in a different way. This is no address, this is my address. So ESP, uh, the EIP is also this. EIP points to the next instruction we are going to uh, execute. And at this point, ESP still points to X, okay? So this is the status right now. Now we execute the function call, and not the instruction. We execute this instruction, call EAX. So this is an indirect call. EAX is a register. The value of EAX is only known at runtime. So this is something called an indirect call. So what happens to this is, um, this call instruction will do two things. First, remember, this is what the stack looks like. It will first push the address of the next instruction to the stack. Okay, so the current instruction is call EAX 
The next instruction is pop EDX. And this instruction has an address. And this address is pushed onto the stack. So this is a stack before, and now the stack looks like this. Before the stack, the ESP points to X. Now ESP points to the, the address of the end instruction. Then it will move the destination address. In this case, its destination is in EDX. Move that address into EIP, which means the CPU will start execution, start execution again from the address which is stored in EDX. Make sense? Okay. So the reverse operation of call is the return instruction. And the return instruction uh, does something very simple. The return instruction, let's say this is a program and now EIP points to the return instruction. It means next the CPU is going to execute the return instruction, right? The return, when this instruction is executed, the CPU will check what is pointed by ESP and pop that value into EIP. So whatever is X here will be moved into EIP. Then ESP will be um, incremented by four bytes in this one. So ESP, yes, I'm sorry. So ESP will point to value Y here, not a value X anymore, but one of one. Okay, so I'm showing you here is a 32 bit. The 64 bit is the same thing. The only difference is the register size where um, be changed as the register names are changed. They are not ESP, EIP anymore. They are just RSP and the RIP. So when they uh, increment or decrement, they do not uh, increment four bytes instead of the increment eight bytes. That's the only difference overall. 64, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is code. This is code. This is code. So, well, in the line cases, it's supposed to be valid. So that's why for a hacker or a hacker, you want to use it. Another uh, instruction here is the uh, enter instruction. Uh, I explained it before. Uh, the enter instruction is just uh, kind of like um, the combination of three instructions. And this is usually used at the beginning of a function. Uh, most cases you will see those three instructions instead of enter. Um, so I can explain, I want to explain to you uh, what we do. Uh, they are usually used at, at the beginning of the function assume the stack we have before those three instructions uh, look like this esp points to the value x on the stack so the first instruction will be push edp so when you push something to stack means you are preserving it right means you are going to reuse this register and you want to preserve the value of the register to the memory that's why you do a push so when do a push EBP, then the EBP's uh, value will be stored here from a little bit lower than the X, okay? Then we're going to do a move instruction. So after this push, what I also changed is ESP. Because whenever you do a push, ESP will change, right? So after the first instruction, the ESP actually points here, okay? I'm not, I didn't draw this part, but ESP points are here. Then we do a, a move instruction. We move ESP to EBP. Okay. So after that, since we move from ESP to EBP, means we copy down from ESP to EBP. So both of them were point to the same place, right? So both ESP and EBP were point to this place. Okay. Then we do a subtract some number from ESP. So after this, ES, ESP were jump from this place to this place. 
And the distance between them is that number, several bytes. But the EBP stays here, right? This is usually what happens at the beginning of a function to create uh, the stack frame, function frame for a function. And why we're doing this subtract, okay? This place is usually reserved for the local variables. That's why I do the subtract. Uh, I will show you more concrete examples later. Okay, so the reverse operation of uh, enter is leave. Leave is equivalent to move EBP to ESP, then pop EBP. Let's assume this is what the stack look like and where each register is. EBP points to the old EBP value. ESP points to here. So we move EBP to ESP, which means um, ESP were also pointed to here now, right? Then we do a pop EBP, means ESP will go up here and the value which is stored here will go to EBP because we do the pop. So this is to this is the reverse operation of the enter to restore everything in the EBP. Okay, later we will, we will say more examples uh, to say uh, why we are doing uh, this. Way. Okay, since the stack is each function's uh, scratch memory, uh, each function allocated space for its local variables on the stack, uh, the address of those local variables uh, cannot be fixed at runtime because for one function, you can call it multiple times. So there are multiple instances of that function. So you do, and those functions, they all have a local variable. So those local variables address cannot be fixed at uh, compiler time. It's different from global variables. Global variables, you can fix them at uh, compiler time, but local variables, you cannot. There could be, and also there could be multiple copies. And at a, only at a runtime, you will know how many copies do you need. Compiler time, you don't know. So uh, how do we access those global variables at a runtime? Um, um, the way we access them is to use uh, relative addressing. Um, there are many different ways to implement that. Uh, we can use PC relative addressing. For example, I work on ARM architecture and in ARM, especially in embedded system, we're using uh, PC related relative addressing. However, in Intel, especially all the examples we use in this class, we usually use the register EBP uh, to point to the start of the function's frame on the stack. Then we use uh, the EBP to address different things on the stack. For example, like this one, uh, after we set up everything, the stack looks like this. And the EBP points to kind of like the beginning of the, uh, this function stack. So everything lower than EBP is a local variable. Everything higher than EBP could be the parameters of the function, could be other functions, local variables, okay? So um, you don't have to remember this, but uh, you, you should have a feeling that a function's stack frame, when we, when we, say, when we uh, say this term stack frame, usually it means it starts with where EBP points to, and it ends with where ESP points to. So EBP points to here, that's the start of the function's stack frame, and ESP, this is the end of the uh, function's stack frame. So to call a save function, uh, you were give some parameters and the other, sometimes other information. Uh, and the according convention it defines who stores those information and where to store those information. Um, it could be the caller's job to store that. It also could be the callee's job to do that. Uh, different architectures, uh, operating systems, uh, compiler optimizations may use different conventions. So in this class, we will first talk about the say, um, I think it's called C declare, maybe C standard convention. So this is a convention used by when you compile a C library, this is a, a default convention. 
So in this convention, function A calls function B. Function A required caller. Function B required call E. Okay. So the caller will first push the arguments onto the stack. And the arguments are pushed uh, in right to left order. If there is only one argument, that one argument is pushed to stack, onto the stack. If there are three arguments, the third argument is first pushed onto the stack, then the second and the first one. After that, the caller will execute the call instruction to call the call E. And the call instruction, like we just discussed, will push the address of uh, the instruction after the call instruction to the stack, then move the destination to the uh, EIP or PC. Then in the call E, it's the call E's job to push the previous frame pointer onto the stack. That is the EBP we just saw. Then it will set up its own frame pointer by uh, moving ESP to EBP. Then it will create a space for its own local variables. That's the subtract uh, several bytes from ESP, you saw that. Then when, when the function finishes, it has to make sure the stack is consistent. Um, or this is called the uh, balanced stack. Uh, to do that, uh, you use the leave instruction to solve that. Uh, then it also returns the return value uh, in the EAX uh, register. So that's why uh, very often you see the following three instructions in the call E to set up its own function uh, frame, stack frame. Uh, they are usually called the function uh, prologue. So they are the same as the enter instruction. Uh, the first one is push EBP, then move ESP to EBP, then subtract some menu from the ESP. Okay. Um, you need to, you are going to say this a lot. So it's better for you to understand what's going on instead of remembering this. Okay. The first one, push previous frame pointer onto the stack. The next one, change the base pointer to the stack. The third one allocates some space for its own uh, function to use. Um, then since we have uh, the prologue, we also have epilogue and the epilogue does those three things, move EBB to ESP, pop EBB, then just uh, uh, return. Okay, next we are going to look at uh, a real program. Uh, let me see. I have an animation. Oh, okay, I have an animation here. So this is a program we just saw. Right? A simple program. This is a func func they code. This is the main function. It's a disassembly code, and this is uh, the disassembly of the uh, function func. Okay. So in the main function, we say there is a call instruction. So this call instruction will call the main function, call into the fun function. And uh, you can say, what I want to show you is, um, let's see where is the main function. The main function, when the main function calls this function, it gives it it gives it a parameter 10, right? So based on what we saw on the slide, that 10 should be pushed onto the stack. And let's say if we can find instructions to do that. Okay, here, there is a push uh, A in hex. A in hex is 10. So when we do that push, we're actually passing the parameter 10 to funk. After we push that parameter, we make the call. This is a call instruction. After that, we go here. So in this call instruct, in this func uh, program, we first push EBP, then we move ESP to EBP, then we subtract 18 in hex. 18 in hex has 24 bytes. We subtract 24 bytes from the ESP. Then we do all kinds of calculations. Okay. So um, 
we can see. So this is a figure I usually draw um, of the stack. On top is high address, on, uh, on the bottom is the low address. And we have several arguments here. It's for a function that could be several arguments, argument two, argument one. Then there is a return address. Then there is a saved EBP. Then there's no variables. So those are how we address different things. For example, when you do a uh, round bracket EBP means you are what, you are accessing the old saved EBP. If you plus four, if, if your EBP points to here, if you're plus four, you are getting the return address. If you are plus eight, you are getting the first argument. If you are plus uh, twelve, the second argument, right? If you are doing something EBP minus eight, then you are accessing something here. So that is will be the local variable, and this is what the function frame looks like. Um, several more examples here. Um, let's see. Yeah. You cannot change the EBPA. That that's that's a very good point. We don't we don't change the EBPA. Yeah. But in that function, the core function, the core function may be calling a lot of them. So the core becomes four. Right? That's that's you have to change the EBP. That's why you have to preserve the EBP. That's why you do that switch. Switch to EBP. Yeah. That's a that's a very good uh, question. Okay. So let's do a, a simple uh, quiz here. Uh, let's say we have EBP, we're moving some data from the memory address EBP minus eight to EAX. Then we are load effect, effective address from EBP uh, minus 24, okay? So what, what do you think those two instructions are doing? The first one is kind of like, getting the value of a local variable, right? The second one is kind of like getting the address of a local variable because they are all EBP minor something, okay? But this one is a little bit different. This one is uh, EBP plus eight. Like we said that EBP, EBP points to here, EBP plus four is return address, EBP plus eight is argument one. So this instruction is actually accessing the first argument this instruction is accessing the second argument. Of course, this is 32 bit. If it's 64 bit, everything will be uh, four bytes more. Okay. Uh, let's see another example. Um, so this example also demonstrates a uh, whole stack works. Um, you know, in C programming, you can do something very cool called a recursion. Means uh, you, a function can call itself, right? So here I have a, a function called a fact. It's actually a factorial, right? So the fact function will compute uh, the factorial of a uh, integer. Um, the integer is given as n here. Um, Inside this function, I will print out, I am calculating the factorial of which number. Then if that number is one, then we will return one. If that number is not one, we will return um, that number n times the factorial of n minus one, okay? So anyone here doesn't understand what the factorial is? Okay, we're well, good. So as a main function, basically just to take uh, input from you, then um, calculate the factorial for you by calling, um, where is that? By, by here, calling that uh, number. So if we try this on our server, I have a channel here. 32 bit version. Okay, let's try a small number. 
like the five. Okay. So this is what the program uh, outputs look like. We are going to compute the factorial five, which is one times two times three times four times five. Okay, the result is one twenty. By doing that, the function factorial set is calling itself five times. The first time it calls itself, the first time we call this function, we are actually in fact five. Okay. Then we're printing out the parameters address. And you can see the parameters address is on stack FF A64 7E0. Okay, 7E0. So in that fact five, it, to, cap, to compute it itself, he it has to compute fact four, right? So it will make a lot of call to itself to do fact four. And the stack goes down. That's why you can say in fact four, we also have that parameter M. However, the address here is seven C zero. Previously it was seven E zero. So it goes down. Okay. Then fact four calls fact three. So the stack keep going down to from C zero to A zero. We do fact two, it goes to eight, uh, 780, then 760. So this one clearly shows that how you in Increment recursion in C. So those even though the local the parameter has the same name M, but every time it has a different address in different function instance. Okay. So if we do the same thing for the 64 bit version, uh, you can say the same thing. Oh, where is it? Oh. I forgot to put a 64B version here. Okay, anyway, let's go ahead. Oh, so there is another example I want to show you. Um, oh, yeah, this one I want to show you is um, five parameters. Oh, by the way, when you run our uh, challenges on the platform. If you want to get the source code, uh, click this button, download the source code button. Okay. So here is when you click this, we create a Docker image for you to do testing. If you need to get the source code, click here. Uh, you get the source code of the program. This is the source code of the program. For this one, Uh, I'm going to use OBJ object style, then disassemble this program. Uh, when you disassemble this, you can see there are so many functions. Many of the functions are not de are not developed by the programmer. Like I said, they're part of the C library. They are um, statically compiled into linked into the program. It's not really developed by you, so you don't need to pay attention to those functions. For example, init. You don't need to pay attention to. What you need to pay attention to is your function here. Uh, in this one, we have a main function and a, a FP function. The FP function takes five parameters. The only thing we do is add them together. And this main function calls that FP function. Okay. Like I said, here we have five parameters to pass. So we're going to pass the rightmost parameter first. So this one is pushed on the stack first. This one is pushed on the stack first, then four, then three, two, one. Okay. So let's confirm that in the code. Let's find the main function. The main function calls. Oh, this is the main function. Oh, this function, this version will optimize that way. Hmm. After we recompile this, it's optimized away. Let me see. Oh, too bad. This one optimized away, but you can 
here say it's from let me see wait two yeah it's not an output anything okay I, I think I made a mistake here uh let, let me I should have a local version okay let me try my local version Let's do a OBJ down. So the main function somehow the parameters are um, optimized away. Uh, I'm not sure what happens there, but it, in the FP function, you can still say that. So in the FP function, we are trying to access five parameters on the back, right? So the last one, the, the one with the lowest address would be, um, yeah, this one is even using ESP, not using EDP. Uh, too too much optimization here. Is this because oh I know what happens. Uh, okay, I will I will skip this one and we will revisit one next uh, next week. Um, next week. So somehow the version I'm showing you is not the version I want to show you. Okay. Uh, in the homework. You will also uh, try something different. There is a fast call example, uh, like I said. So in the standard case, we will put the parameters onto the stack. But if there is a fast call optimization for functions, then we do not have to put those onto the stack. We put the parameters in the registers. So the stack is part of a memory. So accessing it, writing it is a slow. However, uh, registers are part of the CPU, so are much faster. Uh, in the 64-bit version of uh, Intel, uh, things are a little bit different. Uh, we do not put everything onto the stack anymore. Uh, instead, uh, we put the, by default, even by default, we put the argument in the registers. That's because we have so many more registers in the 64-bit version of the CPU, but in 34-bit version, we don't have so many, so we use the stack. That's why 64-bit version is also uh, faster, not only because the registers are longer, there are also more registers. Um, the example here you can see is there are many more registers like R8, R9, R10, which were not available in 32-bit version. Okay, let's do our uh, very first uh, uh, hack here. This is, we try to overwrite a local variable here. Uh, this code is called the overflow local. Uh, we have very simple code. We have a main function. The main function checks how many arguments you are giving. You have to give two arguments. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't do anything. Uh, if you give two arguments, it will call this volful function. Volful function takes two arguments. One is an integer, another is a pointer. The integer is just, uh, uh, we're giving zero here. Then there's a local variable j, we assign this zero to j, then there is a buffer. The buffer in C code, the buffer is six bytes. Here, as you can see. Then we do a string copy from whatever you are giving from P to the buffer. So remember, 
this P, this pointer is controlled by the user, okay? The user will input something. This is the second command line argument. Whatever user input will be copied into the buffer. So what could happen here? The user could input much bigger than six bytes, right? So that is where the buffer workflow uh, from. Then there is a J. At the beginning, remember, J's value is zero. So, uh, so we have an if J, which means if J's value is not zero, we will call the function print flag, which there is a local flag file to um, show you the flag. Otherwise, it will print I pity the fool. That's it. That's the simple uh, program. So let's say this program in our server first. We have the program here, over overflow local one. This is a folder we have. This is a flag file, right? We don't have access to the flag file. But this program is a vulnerable set UID program. Uh, so this program has access to the flag file. If we run this program, what will happen is it will not do anything. Why don't do anything? Because here we have a check how many arguments you have. If you only have one argument, command line argument, then the program do not do anything, just uh, exit. Otherwise, if we do this one, three, three, give it some, the second command line argument, it will run the program. The program will run into, oops, the program will run into here. Uh, it copies what I put there, three, three into buffer. Then it will check the value of J, which is zero in this case, right? That's why it print out IPD the full. Okay. That's it. So our goal here is very simple. We want the program to print out the flag for us instead of uh, calling us the full. Okay. So how do we do that? For something like this, we always look at the um, disassembly code to fully understand what's going on. If you look at the C code, sometimes things would be a little bit different. Um, the C code do not necessarily match in the binary code because the compiler will do a lot of optimization. The compiler is not that faithful, okay? It will do all kinds of optimization. So on the right hand, we have the disassembly of all tool. How do you get this? You will just uh, uh, do an object down, obj down, hyphen d on this program. Then you can disassemble this. You can get this disassembly code. Yeah. What was what? I understand your question. So let's see the C code here. Whether you print out the flag or you print out the IP to the full is determined by the local variable J, right? So if J is any other number, positive number, it will go to print flag. If J is zero, it will print IP to the full. Make sense? And J as here, we set it as zero. That's why we'll go here. Make sense? Okay. So um you you guys know what is string copy, right? So basically string copy will copy uh, from the source location to the destination, it only stops at a zero, a null. Okay. So if your input is very long, you will copy everything. Uh, this is a, a simple implementation of string copy. There's a more compact version. 
but they are equivalent. So let's take a look at this function here and say, uh, what is our thought process here if we want to exploit this? So let's assume this is uh, what the stack look like when we enter this function. Like I said, this function is called by the main function, right? So there is a return address. The return address is actually something in the main function. Uh, higher than the return address, those are two arguments. The first one is I, the other one is P, right? Those are the two arguments. So now we are in the first instruction, push EBP. So after this instruction, what we have is the old EBP is pushed down to stack and the ESP points to it. Then the next instruction is move ESP to EBP. So, um, so move ESP to EBP. So what happens this one is both ESP and EBP were points to here, okay? Then we subtract 18 in hex, which is 20, 24 in decimal from ESP. So ESP will go down from somewhere here. And uh, in between, there will be 18 in hex bytes. Okay, so far so good. Now, the next instruction is to move EBP plus eight to EAX. EBP plus eight, EBP is here, plus eight is that, is that parameter I. So we're moving that value of parameter I to EAX. So after this, EAX has a value zero because that's, that's a parameter we give, zero. Then we will do another move EAX to EBP minus C. So since it's EBP minus something, that's part of the local variable. At the, at the binary level, there is no name for those local variables, just address. And that address is EBP minus C. We know that the whole place is uh, 18 in hex, 24 bytes. And minus C, C is what? 12, 12 bytes. So still in this range. We're moving EAX to there. So basically what we're doing is we're copying this I to here, right? So remember our, I think I downloaded the source code. Oh, didn't download. Let me see which one do this. Let me show you the source code in another window. Be easier. So what that piece of code is doing, I don't know how to make this larger. Anyway, is just to assign that i to j, right? J is a local variable. I is that parameter. So assign i to j. That is what this instruction is doing. So after that, we subtract uh, ESP again to get more room. So now the room we have is 32 bytes. So after that, we push EDP plus C. And this is an address. We're pushing an address here. Um, so, oh, no, no, no. We're pushing an EPP plus C is this one, the, the P. We're pushing that one to here. Then we know the effective address uh, EBP minus 12. Remember, this one is C, so 12 will be lower than this because this is 12 in hex. So we're going to move this address into EAX. So now EAX points to this place. And this place is the local variable, the buffer. It's actually the buffer here. So now uh, we're going to call the, which function? We're going to call the string copy function. String copy the function, it takes two arguments. That's why we need to push those two things onto the stack before we call it, right? So we're going to push P there, we're going to push buffer there. That's why back here, we do a lot of push EAX. So after this, on this, on the stack, we have, here we have the address of the buffer, we have the P, then now we can make the function call to string copy, right? 
So what the string copy does is to copy everything to this buffer, right? Now this is very dangerous because what you copy there could be larger than the buffer. We know the buffer here is um, six bytes. 12, this is 12 in hex is 18 bytes. Then here is C, which is 12 bytes, right? So 12 minus uh, 18 minus 12. So actually the buffer is only six bytes. So what are you, but whatever we input could be longer than, longer than eight, uh, six bytes. So if our input is longer than six bytes, what will happen? Remember, it will be copied from here. To, it will what? It will override J, what else? We can actually override everything here above this, right? We can override everything. But for, for this challenge, we just want to override J. So after we override J, what happens? Later, the, after we override J, uh, what happens is the J value is changed. It's not zero anymore. So when we do this compare, uh, compare it will be bigger than zero and it will print out a flag instead of print out IPD the full. Does that make sense? Okay, let's go back to the code here to finish this program. Now, this one we are calling string copy. After we call string copy, we are going to balance the stack. That's why we have this instruction, ESP plus 10. Um, then, like I said, this variable could be compromised. Now we have a compare, we compare EBP minus C. EBP minus C is this local variable J. We compare whether the value is zero. Um, it's bigger than zero actually. If it's uh, equal, it were, um, if it's equal, it jumps to IPD the full. Uh, if it's not, uh, it will go to uh, print all of the flag. Okay. So, so now you see the vulnerable, the vulnerability here. So how do we, how do we trigger this vulnerability? A long string, okay. How long do we need? More than one? Yes, more than six bytes. So let's try this. So we do, oh wait, what's the name? So if we just do, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. When, when we do six bytes, it doesn't change anything. Still pretty the full, okay? But if we do seven bytes, we get the plan. So that's our first hack. So what you can do is you just uh, uh, copy this and submit, okay? So this is also all the CTF exams where it look like. Our design challenges like this, you get the flag, you submit. Uh, in the homework, there are points for that, but uh, in the homework, we don't care about points. Only in the CTF, we care about points. So if we have seven bytes, it will override the J. But if we have more than that, what will happen? We have many, many more. What will happen? What? Yes, but why function will crash? Yes, because we're going to override everything here. Not only return address. Actually, we're, we're also, before we override the return address, we will override this save the EVP. So when you override the save the EVP, most likely eventually it will crash sooner or later, okay? Because um, this function, because the caller of this function relies on the save the EVP, right? Well, we have a we have a exploit to, uh, in which you cannot override the return, but only override the save the EVP, and you you still need to um, you still need to um, crash it, uh, not crash it, exploit it. So in this case, because you override the return, and the, whatever you put here right now is not a valid code address, it's some random address, and when you do that random address. When you return, the EIP will point to that random address. It will access a memory doesn't exist, so the program crash. So we'll do it here. The 
programmer crash, it shows segment four. However, before that, it still print out the flag for you because the flag print was successful. Okay. Yeah. You always ask a very good questions. You can also get. So in the Python, I'm trying to do that for everything worth Okay, so uh, we actually can do the same thing for the 64 bit version of the uh, program. Uh, you can see that the same source code, uh, the 64 bit version, the disassembly would be slightly different. But the theory, uh, the principle behind it is the same. Here we still call the string copy, but before we call string copy, we're not pushing the arguments on the stack because 64 bit were putting the parameters in the registers. That's why here you can see a lot of move registers, not push on the stack. Uh, however, the buffer, mm, so let's see, I think maybe this one is, uh, one of this is the uh, buffer address. Yeah, still overwriting, um, we can still uh, exploit that. Okay, so before we, before we finish the class, there's one more, there's one more uh, challenge we're going to do today. Okay. So this one is a little bit trickier than the previous one. Here we have the same buffer overflow, but now we do not check if J is uh, zero or non-zero. J has to be a specific value. One, two, three, four, five, six, whatever, okay? So now if we want to exploit this one, to print the flag, what should we do? Yes, exactly. You said backward? Yeah, good, because there's a little onion. Right, good. So let's say we go to, where is it? Uh, overflow two. Okay, this is overflow two. So this is where I also introduce you um, a lot of tools. How do you write uh, Python here? So so when we run this, we get segment four. Do this with PT the full segment four. If we do uh, six characters, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, PT the full seven. PT the full because we do not give it to the value, right? So we have to give that specific value, which is this thing. But the most character here is not mapping to any ASCII you can type, right? That's why we need to use um, a script language. Uh, I, use, I usually use Python to do this. So what you do is you do a, this one, then you do a dollar sign, uh, Python, uh, on this server, we have Python 2 and Python 3. Uh, I'm familiar with Python 2, so I'm using Python 2 syntax. So we are doing print, then four numbers. This one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, because this is little Indian. Uh, we, we actually also need the, we need the buffer. But does the value for the buffer matter? Why? Doesn't matter. We're just putting into the buffer, right? It's just a placeholder. 
we just do let's do dd then times six then plus six okay does it make sense uh what we can do is let's delete this one this one first okay this one steer is uh, ip data four so if we do 12 this is steer not working let's see what's going on here oh here the dd should we this one yeah okay so if we do not have this it should not give us the flag right because we're not putting that number on the stack IP data pool. but if i do 12 i'm going to put exactly the number onto the stack and give us the flag make sense okay so uh, all of this, what I demo in the class, uh, you need to redo it in the homework, and also there is more challenges in the homework. Uh, for example, in this week, there is a crack me, there is a crack me one, not crack me two. I love it. A crack me one is for you to understand to practice your reverse engineering uh, skills. A uh, crack me two is probably similar to uh, this. Uh, so what do we did today is a very simple overflow. We only overflow local variables. We didn't try to overflow the MVP uh, or the return. Okay. So in the following weeks, we are going to say how we can overflow those things and how, how we can get. A, eventually, we want to get a shell. We're gonna we want to get a shell with root privilege. Then we can type any commands in the system. To do that, there are many more steps, including how to. Uh, design a share code, understand how share code works. Um, so after that, we'll talk about how to treat this kind of attacks. So this kind of old buffer flow flow, like I said, it was discovered 30 years ago. So right now, our systems have already have very good protection against this kind of attacks. Uh, however, this is uh, like a baby step foundation. So after the midterm, we will study advanced attacks. Uh, a lot of them cannot be um, well defeated right now. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Um, not all the variables were destroyed. The parameters were destroyed. The local variables are the answer. And also, um, a lot of things. In the source code we have here, uh, this J is defined as an integer. So this is a pre code now. Uh, no matter no matter you are compiling this to the So the so the same the same exploit. So this what I call this is this is an exploit. By the way, um, oops, what's going on? This value doesn't matter, right? Because this, so we can put whatever here. It should, it should give us a flag, okay? So this is what I call an exploit. Then the 64-bit version, overflow 64, This should work. Let's see. Yeah, it works. Yeah, because that's an integer. So it's still just the comparing four bytes. Of course, after this, I don't, it looks like it's waiting for more things. Yeah. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, any questions from the online folks? Okay, good.
Oh, seems like there are questions. Oh no. Cool. Any questions from the board? Okay, see you guys next week.